Greetings, everyone. I'm Simone Sanders Townsend in for Stephanie Rule. We are now 264 days away from the election, and it has been an eventful day in Donald Trump's court cases. We begin in Georgia, where DA Fonnie Willis took the stand and fired back against allegations of misconduct in the election interference case. My colleague, Blaine Alexander, has more. Late today, Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis herself took the witness stand. And I've been very anxious to have this conversation with him today. So I ran to the court. In an often contentious back and forth. It, it, it is a lot. It is, it is a lot. Right. Willis was pressed about details of her personal relationship with Nathan Wade, who she hired as special prosecutor on the Trump case. You and Mr. Wade met in October 2019 at a conference? That is correct. And I think in one of your motions, you tried to implicate and slept with him at that conference, which I find to be extremely offensive. Willis's testimony was a shocking twist in a fiery evidentiary hearing that focused on allegations that Willis financially benefited from her personal relationship with Wade in the form of romantic getaways. Allegations first made by Trump co-defendant Michael Roman and his attorney, Ashley Merchant, in an effort to get Willis removed as prosecutor, a move that would throw the entire Georgia case against Mr. Trump into question. You think I'm on trial. These people are on trial for trying to steal an election in 2020. I'm not on trial, no matter how hard you try to put me on trial. At issue, who paid for vacations the two took together? Wade and Willis both testified they split costs evenly, or she reimbursed him. You never wrote him a check? Ma'am, I don't have checks. When pressed for evidence, Willis said she used cash. For many, many years, I have kept money in my house. I don't need anything from a man. A man is not a plan. A man is a companion. And so there was tension always in our relationship, which is why I was give him his money back. I don't need anybody to foot my bills. Both Wade and Willis have acknowledged a personal relationship. The question, when it began, before or after she hired him on the Trump case, in November of 2021. Today, a longtime friend of Willis and former employee testified that relationships started well before then. You have no doubt that their romantic relationship was in effect from 2019 until the last time you spoke with her. No doubt. And later, when pressed by Trump attorney Steve Sadow. Did you observe them do things that are uh, say common among people having a romantic relationship? Yes. Such as, can you give us an example? Hugging, kissing, this affection. All, of, all before November 1st of 2021, correct? Yes. But Willis took exception. I certainly do not consider her a friend now. Um, I think that she, you know, there's a saying, no good deed goes unpunished, and um, I think that she betrayed our friendship. Willis says she and Wade started dating in early 2022, after she hired him. In New York, a judge ordered that Trump's hush money case will go forward on March 25th. Now, this will be the first criminal trial involving a former president. And tomorrow in New York, we could get the verdict in Trump's $370 million civil fraud trial. Now, the judge has already found that Donald Trump engaged in fraud. The verdict is about the penalties. In Washington, Donald Trump's team has filed its reply to Jack Smith's filing to the Supreme Court about the presidential immunity issue. That means the justices could now rule at any time. Meanwhile, special counsel Robert Hur, he is expected to testify before a Republican-led House panel next month, and, and likely about the findings in his classified documents probe, specifically his characterization of President Biden as a, quote, elderly man with a poor memory. With that, let's bring in our leadoff panel. Lots to discuss. Annie Linsky, White House reporter for The Wall Street Journal. Former U.S. Attorney Joyce Vance, who spent 25 years as a federal prosecutor. And Ankush Kadori, a former federal prosecutor and contributing writer for Politico magazine. Powerhouse panel, thank you all for being here tonight. Joyce, I, I want to start with you. You know, today, D.A. Fonnie Willis went toe-to-toe -to -toe with defense lawyers. What did you make of it? So it was a lot of spectacle, but not very much substance, Simone, because the burden of proof is on the defendants here, the ones who raise the conflict of interest, to establish that it exists. And if we're going strictly on the evidence we heard today, I did not hear them meet that burden. It was obviously a tough day for Fonnie Willis, and prosecutors are supposed to have thick skin 
and shake things like this off. She came in a little bit hot and emotional, but that was understandable given the sort of full-on discourse the judge permitted into her personal life, forcing her to explain things like her dad's attitude about money. I think the judge will look at the evidence and he'll make a hard calculation based on whether the defense met its burdens. And unless they've got more evidence tomorrow, they didn't do it today. Mm. Ankush, we heard a, a, a witness appear to contradict the timeline of Willis's relationship with Special Prosecutor Nathan Wade. Um, uh, she was the only one. I, I, tomorrow we have more testimony coming, so I don't know if we'll hear others. How important is this one witness? At this point, it's her word against Fonnie Willis's and Nathan Wade's. Well, I mean, she's absolutely critical for the defendant's case, right, because she is the only evidence that they have. However, uh, I agree with uh, Joyce here. I mean, I think we have to separate the spectacle, which mm -hmm. was riveting, let's be honest, from the substance. I mean, here. it was like a soap opera. It, it was, was better than reality. It television. was unlike anything I've ever seen. I watched every minute of it, and I was not planning to. Um, her testimony, I, I didn't think, was terribly helpful, because once you started to poke at it, right, she has uh, motivation to sort of uh, uh, embellish a bit because she mm -hmm. left the office under poor circumstances. She apparently was shown the door effectively. And, you know, she was pressed on, you know, when did these conversations occur? She couldn't remember where did they occur, which was a very good question because people may not remember when they heard something, but they will often remember the surroundings. She couldn't answer that. Um, and so I think as a result, it kind of didn't come off very persuasive. And against that, you have um, Mr. Wade and Ms. Willis offering what I thought was quite credible testimony. We could all, you know, describe what we think are fairly odd or unusual elements of it based on our own experience. But I thought on the whole, they were on the stand for hours and they were consistent and I thought they were mostly credible. Mm. Um, let's remind everyone what Fonnie Willis had to say when the indict indictment of uh, not just Donald Trump, but it was a racket, it was a RICO case. So there's lots of other individuals in August. Let's remind folks, play this. I make decisions in this office based on the facts and the law. Um, the law is completely nonpartisan. That's how decisions are made in every case. To date, this office has indicted, since I've been sitting as a district attorney, over 12,000 cases. This is the 11th RICO indictment. We followed the same process. We look at the facts, we look at the law, and we bring charges. Joyce, let's go back to today, and let's separate the legal aspect of this from the optics. Um, our colleague Charles Coleman points out that there are two ways for a district attorney qualification in Georgia. One, forensic misconduct. He's, he notes that that is not alleged here. And then two, actual conflict, which he says has not been established. What is your take on this, Joyce? Because if that is the standard, I, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a legal person. I was just someone that, you know translated what the lawyers have to say back in the day, but this just doesn't seem to add up. I think Charles is dead on the money here. Under Georgia law, you have to have an actual conflict of interest, a financial interest in the outcome of the case. The classic example in Georgia would be if you had a special prosecutor who was only paid if they got a conviction. That's the sort of thing that creates incentives that are contrary to justice. Here you've got two lawyers on the same side of a case, and the best the defense has to offer is this sort of crazy theory that somehow Fonnie Willis is getting kickbacks for hiring Wade in the form of expensive vacations. And there's simply no evidence of that after today. She testifies that she pays for roughly half. Um, her testimony was credible. You know, she doesn't say that they split everything 50-50 down the middle. She just says, a man is not a plan. I don't need a man to pay for me. I pay for myself. And there's nothing that the defense really offers to rebut her testimony. Ankush, you know, uh, it just really strikes me that maybe in the long run, this particular line of questioning and inquiry that we saw today, uh, it, it really doesn't matter when it comes down to the facts of the RICO case that D.A. Fonnie Willis has brought um, in Fulton County. It, shouldn't the legal take precedence here and not just these bad optics? How did we even get to the point where this is happening in court? Well, certainly, you know, as lawyers, right, we want the law and the legal issues to be taking precedence. How we got here, I mean, I just have to be honest, I think that the DA mishandled this, mm -hmm. uh, her response. I think she should have come out much more quickly, much more pointedly. Frankly, the, the sort of facts she described today at length could have been condensed, the material ones, into a page mm -hmm. or two of an affidavit and submitted to the court. That is what should have happened. It didn't, so that's where we are today. Um, 
In terms of like the legal versus the optics, though, you know, the near term problem for her is the legal problem. And I agree with the, the, the view that most other people have articulated today, which is she will probably not be disqualified if the, the shape of the evidence remains as it was today. However, the optics are not entirely within her control, right? The optics, we call it the optics, but who's watching? Potential jurors are watching, her constituents are watching. Um, I've been struck just, you know, watching non-lawyers react tonight mm -hmm. because that, in many ways that has been more interesting to me to see the people who have been talking about it and hearing their reactions because they're seeing something very different uh, than what Joyce or I may have saw, seen, right? They're looking at temperament, mm -hmm. flashes of anger, evasiveness, and I think people are processing that in ways that lawyers can't entirely wrap their heads around.